Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Ashton Bloomberg New Energy Finance webinar on energy access and crisis. How will SMEs survive and thrive? I'm Christine Ives Singer, Senior Advisor at Sustainable Energy for All, and I have the opportunity and the pleasure today to moderate a very interesting and thought-provoking conversation uh, with the perspectives coming from uh, those who are operating in the field, delivering energy access services, and those who are seeking to intermediate increased financing uh, to those very enterprises who are serving those without. And so with that, I'm going to just start with a few housekeeping items, and then we're gonna jump into uh, a, a short presentation and a discussion. First, I'd like to advise you that Ashton is recording the webinar and following the webinar, a link will be shared. There'll be a follow-up communication. We all know the quality of the, the quality and the, and the excellence of the Ashton communications. So there'll be a follow-up coming out from this session, which will include a link to the webinar, as well as the materials that will be presented by our uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance colleague. Uh, we'll also be sharing some resources that may be of interest to you if you want to dig a little bit deeper into some of the information that's being presented. We are going to allow some time uh, for question and answer at the end of the session. And so if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box and I'll either integrate them into the discussion straight out or we'll come back to them towards the end. So why are we here? I don't think it's, it's uh, news to anyone that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has really uh, impacted the global economy, both on, on, on personal levels with, with health issues, as well as the economic impacts that many uh, of us and many of uh, those that we're trying to serve in the developing world are suffering. Ashton's been working with their very extensive and deep alumni network, their award winners, and as well as a wider network to understand how this virus is impacting their operations. And then figuring out what are the ways by which Ashton and others can actually support these enterprises that are delivering such life uh, changing services. They've been really seeking to give the enterprises, their award winners in this network, a broader voice at the table to really communicate what's happening, what can be done now, and how do we address these issues as we move into the future. Ashton joined with Sustainable Energy for All and the World Bank back in September and convened a group of donors to really bring these issues to the forefront and has been following up in the sharing of information on exactly what types of financial intermediaries, such as we have on the line today, what they're doing to bring services and capital to the enterprises that need them, as well as some of the innovations that are going on at the enterprise level. We're here today to bring some of these innovations to the forefront to share with you as part of the Ashton partnership with Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is really seeking in this partnership to share information and insights around the financing and scaling of energy access and climate solutions. This is the second of three webinars brought to you by Ashton and Bloomberg New Energy Finance with support from Bloomberg Philanthropies. So with that context, Thinking about energy access being in crisis, what can we do to help these SMEs thrive and survive? I'm now going to turn to Takahiro Kawahara, who's the Frontier Power Senior Associate at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, who's going to give us a brief overview of what's happening within the uh, climate space, the energy access space, and where COVID fits in that. So Takahara, over to you, please. Thank you for introduction, Chrissy. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Takehiro Kawahara. So I am an um, analyst working at the Bloomberg NEF. Um, and I belong to a team called the Frontier Power Team, which covers uh, distributed energy in emerging market in particular. Could you go to the next slide, please? So from me, I will give, I will share a quick overview of COVID-19 impacts on energy access sector how small scale companies and consumers and different stakeholders are affected. Next, please. Um, in the beginning, I, let me give you a very quick overview of what Bloomberg NEF does. In short, it's called the Bloomberg NEF. So we are the one organization belonging to Bloomberg. And what we do is to provide um, advisory services based on data and analysis for our stake, for stakeholders in the public and private sectors to make better decision makings, 
towards decarbonization. Um, mainly, we have the four different sectors to cover, which are clean power, advanced transport, building in industry, and recently agriculture and land. Those sectors contribute to um, carbon emissions in a major scale. Next slide, please. What is relevant to clean energy in emerging countries, and especially energy access uh, stakeholders? Uh, we have just launched new climate scope 2020 yesterday. So everyone can access to this URL to see the latest report about insight of clean energy policies and financing and the barriers in 108 emerging countries. And also you can see the data behind that. Next slide, please. In the beginning, let me give you uh, the latest COVID-19 confirmed cases. Um, there's a news of the first vaccines have started to protect from COVID-19 in UK, which is a big step. However, this is not the case for many of the countries in the world. Globally speaking, um, COVID-19 confirmed cases continue to rise. However, the trajectories are very much different by countries. There's still a lot of uncertainty how each country will recover and then how quickly it will happen, especially in emerging countries. Next slide, please. COVID-19 has impacted on energy access, uh, energy access sectors and stakeholders. Um, and then the impacts are different and also levels are different depending on the country and also type of stakeholders. For example, for the governments, as COVID-19 pandemic has spread out, the economic situation has got worsened. And many governments, especially in emerging countries, have faced lack of financial available financial resources to direct to energy access rather than some of the priority for them. One example is that the government of Kenya has decided to increase the butt on clean energy equipment, which is, uh, which is a negative news for the clean energy sector because um, the VAT increase will affect increase of cost of imported equipment from other countries. This is likely that the government wants to increase the tax revenues as is the, the current situation on the finance. And also some of the emerging countries have faced currency depreciation, because, which could make um, the price to buy imported equipment more expensive as many local industries in those countries rely, rely on equipment imported from other countries. Secondly, a lot of healthcare facilities face lack of access to reliable electricity to use medical equipment. This is not a new problem. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that this, this problem is especially critical now. And the consumers are no exception. A lot of consumers have faced reduced payment ability as income falls because of the layoffs or some of, in some cases, um, revenues, revenues have decreased. Please go to the next slide. These are the charts based on the impact, impact data that 60 decibels have collected. In a lot of cases, um, COVID-19 has impacted the payments of consumers in the energy access sector. Um, for example, if you look at the South Asia, in May 2020, more than 50% of the surveyed consumers has responded that they didn't make payments as normally they did. And it seems that there's a link between the payment, payment behavior and the anxiety about making payments for the next month. The situation has got improved in October 2020. However, as the COVID-19 situation is uncertain for the future, a situation of the payment behavior and also the, their anxiety can be, can be varying towards future as well. Please go to the next slide. Finally, um, energy access companies, most of the cases, they are small scale to medium scale enterprises. 
they are also affected in different ways. Um, please go to the next slide, please. These are the charts based on the data collected by NDEV and some of the uh, international organizations and then uh, industry association partners. They have collected impact data from uh, energy access companies, which include crane cooking, mini grids, and off-grid solar companies across 44 countries in Asia and Africa. Almost 70% of the respondent companies said that impacts of COVID-19 on the, their business is significant, at least significant. And 60% of the respondent companies said that as of July, 2020, they could sustain their businesses only up to five months. Hence, they need a lot of assistance, especially financing assistance in the form of grants. Next slide, please. So my last slide is about how uh, different stakeholders in energy access sectors have responded. So some positive news is that the international organizations, impact investors, and donor agencies has responded in a way to set up financial reliefs to support energy access companies. Some emerging countries' governments made response as well. For example, Nigerian government has started to prioritize installing solar hybrid mini grids at healthcare facilities to access to reliable electricity. And also some African governments has announced to cover electricity bills for the consumers. There are also energy access companies that provide solar powered medical equipment and services to support medical staff to provide diagnosis, testing, services for the uh, patients in the rural areas. However, as I mentioned, the future of the COVID impact is still uncertain and assistant, everybody knows that assistance is important, but uh, continuous assistance is very important and how it should happen is also important to discuss in the panel discussion. Let me finish my presentation here and then I would like to hand over to Christine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Takahiro. Uh, some of that information may have been familiar to you, but I think what it really drives home is the fact that uh, we've got, we've, we're, we're in a hole that we have to dig out of. Uh, the virus is still proceeding. Uh, the healthcare situation in many of the markets that we serve is, is still quite serious and, and concerning. Uh, and yet we are still delivering energy access services and seeking to drive towards the SDG seven goals. Some would say that energy access was in crisis even before the pandemic hit. When you looked at the number of individuals in many of these markets without access to electricity and clean cooking. And the four voices that uh, you're about to hear from are of individuals who are working in organizations who were working to direct that crisis or address that crisis before the pandemic and, and meeting just a series of challenges. And we're going to stimulate a little bit of a discussion. How, what, did, what have you done uh, to really move from addressing the crisis of, of those without to the crisis of those without in the state of a pandemic? So I have the pleasure of introducing and talking with four women who are playing catalytic roles in the financing, advocacy, and delivery of energy access, particularly to the last mile. We're going to be in conversation with Salma Islam, who's the project manager for SoulShare. She's responsible for project delivery and marketing at SoulShare, as well as the management of their fundraising portfolio. Uh, SoulShare is a proud Ashton Award winner earlier this year for their peer-to-peer -peer solar energy exchange platform, which allows households and small businesses to trade energy, ensuring that they have access to that energy when they need it. SolShare is based in Bangladesh and their technology gives marginalized communities control of their electricity supply. Esther Altafor is the managing director of East Africa Sistema Bio. She's responsible for, for Sistema Bio's operations in East Africa, which is, and has created an innovative, affordable biogas system that turns animal waste into clean cooking fuel and produces a planet-friendly super fertilizer. 
I had the good fortune, uh, I should, should note, of being on the international, as an international judge on the Ashton Awards panel, had the opportunity to look at both of these companies as they were coming through the process. And I can tell you they're quite exciting and innovative. And I encourage all of you to really explore what these two companies are doing because they're innovative ways about which to deliver services, bringing in finance and the communities. Uh, as I mentioned, Sistema Bio won the Ashton Award for Clean Cooking in 2019. On the finance side, we're going to be joined by Lisa Ashford, who's the director at Ethics and Energize Africa. Lisa is a, a leader in the crowdfunding and impact investment space and has over 20 years experience in energy and environment markets. She's the director and CEO at Ethics, which is a leading ethical and positive investment platform in the UK and founder and director of Energize Africa, which I think many of you may be familiar with as one of the leading cloud uh, crowdfunding platform raising investments for solar businesses and really focused on expanding PAYGO schemes in Sub-Saharan Africa. C combined, these two entities that Lisa works with have raised over 75 million pounds from retail investors, which are basically um, the taxpayers, the individuals who are out there and wanting to put their funding to good work, but not through the government programs, but rather directly through their own, if you will, their own balance sheets. As a short-term measure and in response to the pandemic, Energize Africa has also been giving, giving solar businesses the opportunity to refinance their existing debt. And they've introduced a new grace period, working with companies to enable them to push through this period. Amira Woods is the senior advisor to Shine, which again is from the financing and the advocacy viewpoint, really looking at bringing energy access to the most vulnerable and the least serviced communities those uh, definitely the last mile and most vulnerable. She's a consultant, strategist, researcher, and advocate specializing in social impact and innovation. Originally from Liberia, Amira led ThoughtWork, ThoughtWorks, excuse me, efforts to bring more robust technology solutions in the Ebola crisis, and therefore has a very strong and interesting perspective as we deal with this crisis today. The Shine Campaign is a growing community of foundations, faith-based groups and NGOs dedicated to catalyzing investment in access to safe, clean, reliable, and affordable energy. And Shine has launched the COVID-19 Recovery Fund Grant to enable those last mile energy access uh, enterprises to, uh, to get the times of short-term bursts of capital they need to get past certain crises that they're facing. Definitely helping these enterprises survive uh, as we move through this session. So with that, let's get started in the conversation. Um, I'm going to first turn to Salma and Esther and ask them to give us a brief snapshot of their business, but it, more importantly, explain how you've responded to the COVID crisis. How has your business evolved? How have you innovated? How are you thriving? If you are, please talk with us. If, Salma, if I could go to you first, please. Joining us from Bangladesh today, thank you. Hi, uh, Christine. Thank you so much. Um, so for us, I'll just do a brief introduction of exactly what it is that SoulShare does. Um, so basically, the way our energy exchange platform works, two things to know about Bangladesh. One, we have the largest deployment of solar home systems across, I mean, globally. Uh, there's almost 6 million standalone solar home systems across the country. And we have one of the largest mobile money markets. Um, so leveraging these existing resources that SoulShare did was we found a way to make a more efficient energy exchange system. So the way it works is that we interconnect households and microbusinesses with and without solar home systems. And what this does is that someone without a solar home system is finally able to gain access to electricity whereas previously they were relying on polluting forms of um, energy like kerosene and diesel, fuel wood. Um, as for a household with a solar home system, they're able to sell their excess energy as well as buy additional energy when they need it. So creating this more efficient system, this platform which interconnects these households and micro businesses into, um, 
into little microgrids. What this does, is it allows everyone to gain access to energy all the time, creating a more efficient system. Um, so that's basically the way the platform works. And it's integrated with mobile money exchange, which is infiltrated all over the country. So even the most remote parts of the country have access um, to mobile money. And this is how people are able to put money on their boxes and access electricity. Um, so that's basically how our platform works. It's, it, I mean, it's also created a way to um, get rid of the waste energy. Uh, previously, one of the reasons why we started doing this is because one of the things that we found was that of the 6 million solar home systems, 30% of the energy was being wasted. So this created a way for that energy to actually um, not be wasted and instead to create a more efficient system. Um, so the way that we've started responding to the COVID-19 crisis, one of the things that happened initially when the government lockdown began in March, 11 million people fled the city, like immediately, um, because, you know, people knew that, you know, work was shutting down, especially for a lot of people, uh, lower income, people who lived on daily wages, uh, people just left the city. It was just a rush out of the city. And what happened was, immediately our energy access platforms, like people began consuming more energy at first. So the trend went upward. And then what we saw was that it started going down. Um, and we, we realized that this is mainly because um, people were starting to lose their jobs. Um, nearly 2 million people lost their jobs within the garment sector alone, uh, furloughs were increasing, so the situation got worse over time. And so one of the things that we did was we were applying to COVID funds, obviously, and we won a fund, we won a COVID access fund from the DEG. And uh, through that fund, we were able to start, we began supporting our, our end users uh, through this fund. So things that we did, we started pushing out energy subsidies to all of our end users. Um, we began providing productive energy appliances to people who had initially lost their jobs. So they were looking for ways to earn an income again. Uh, we were providing ways for more people to gain access to energy. So bringing in new users to our platform. Um, and also like for micro businesses, what we were doing was swapping out their batteries so that they get more power um, within their systems to, to power their, their appliances. Um, so these are just some of the things. And then the last thing that we did was also push out healthcare packages to our grid so that people, these are actually the most remote parts of Bangladesh. Um, so people in these areas don't have access to traditional medical facilities, they don't have access to hospitals, so having access to um, healthcare packages, things like solar powered nebulizers, digital thermometers, um, glucometers, so having access to those things allowed them to um, continue with their daily life livelihoods knowing that they had access to at least base medical services within the communities. Thank you, Sama. Uh, I very much appreciate you sharing and, and really applaud the innovation and the responsiveness uh, that SoulShare has shown to your customers and, and, and clients. Esther, let's turn to you with the same question. Uh, to, to give us a snapshot of uh, Sistema Bio and then talk with us uh, about how you responded. Uh, what changed in your business model? And given the fact that you're in multiple locations, um, a sense of what, what may have been different in the different markets you're working in. Great, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm uh, Esther based in, uh, in Nairobi, where I'm calling from today. Uh, I, I hope my internet is good enough. I've had a bit of issues, so please make a sign if you don't hear me. Um, but it should be fine. Um, yeah, so at Sistema Bio, uh, we basically work with smallholder farmers who produce 80% um, of the food that we eat every day, uh, but who are also at the same time uh, the most vulnerable population uh, on, on this planet, systematically lacking access to 
technology capacity building and, and financing. So at Sistema Bio, we really focus our work on smallholder farmers and on empowering them by uh, creating value from their animals waste. So we basically, uh, we manufacture, we distribute, we sell, we install, and we finance uh, a, a high quality biodigester, which basically is a, is a system in which you can input every day the animal waste, your cow waste or pig waste or any organic waste, mix it with water, and this will naturally produce methane, uh, which is biogas that can be used directly for clean cooking. And it will produce, like Christine said, the, the super fertilizer, uh, which is organic and very nutrient rich to apply uh, on your fields to progressively um, switch to, to organic farming uh, and basically contribute to higher productivity and, and more like healthy uh, food for, for the communities. So um, we're a global social enterprise. We started out in, in Mexico, uh, works throughout Latin America and um, opened our East Africa and India operations um, three years ago. So uh, during COVID-19, this has been a, a blessing and a curse at the same time. Uh, I would say that as we've seen in, in Techie Heroes um, slides and graphs about COVID-19, all the different countries have different curves. So it's been a, a roller coaster uh, throughout the year. Um, but overall, um, I think it's been a, a blessing because as Mexico and India went on, on complete lockdown, uh, Kenya has uh, thankfully been um, relatively spared at, at a global level, uh, if I might say so. Um, and so we've been able to uh, continue uh, to, to do our work, uh, even though in, in different circumstances. Uh, so Kenya has been able to consistently deliver sales and deliver installations when all our other geographies were on complete halt and complete slowdown in lockdown, like with everybody staying at home. So uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail, but basically as, a, as an organization, we really started by um, well, just trying to understand what was happening in the world and, and really looking at cash. Uh, what, what, how much uh, runway do we still have and how can we maximize it in, in the worst, worst case scenario. Um, so we really accelerated. I think COVID-19 has been a huge accelerator for us in terms of a lot of um, initiatives that we had planned that instead of um, progressively implementing them in the next 12 to 18 months, we, we did them in three months. Uh, like basically completely looking at our unit economics, reducing costs everywhere we could, relocating warehouse, um, really looking at uh, more efficient ways of, of spending our money and, and basically doing more with, with less resources. Um, we, we put in a complete hiring freeze, so we had to become more creative with the resources we had um, and, and do much more training internally uh, to really um, make sure that, that our current team would, would grow because we didn't have the, 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 the visibility to really add talent. Um, we moved to um, complete remote work for all the headquarter offices. Uh, so, so that's been a really interesting change uh, with like everybody in the world's bedrooms becoming offices uh, and how to maintain a cohesive um, company culture, uh, engagement and motivation despite not being able to see each other has been a, has been a huge challenge. And, and overall, we really started to think as what can, how can we maintain the same level of service to our clients um, uh, without, well, while trying to see them a bit less in person. Uh, so we've done some innovation in terms of um, uh, improving our remote troubleshooting and customer service. So how do we understand more about the problem on the phone and try to troubleshoot it on the phone before sending somebody in person to, to go there? We've done a lot of um, videos to, to help our clients fix their own problems if they have WhatsApp and we can send it to them, which is not the case everywhere. Um, we focused a lot on um, the, the sales side, on uh, 
uh, our existing clients, really building a relationship with them and enhancing our farmer to farmer referral program so that uh, we don't knock on foreigners doors, but we come with a recommendation or the person even already knows that we come because in a door to door sales model like we have in Kenya, it's um, well, our sales team wasn't welcome, uh, even if they would offer hand sanitizer and wear the mask and, and make sure um, that they would connect with uh, our, our potential clients uh, about COVID by, by really even doing some education in the communities. I think just as, a, as, a, as an icebreaker to, to share the sanitizer and to talk about health prevention measures. Um, and, and finally, uh, we've seen the report also from Takehiro on, on loan repayments. Uh, we finance uh, the biodigester, so we give up to 24 month loans um, in the form of asset financing to our clients. And uh, this was the first worry uh, that, that <laughs> our clients would completely stop paying us. So this has been a, a really huge focus on, on maintaining enough sales, getting the cash from collections while reducing cost. Um, and after March and April being like the months of the shock globally, uh, we've really um, improved our processes internally. We've trained our credit team to be extremely empathetic with the clients um, and to really reiterate how much money they're actually saving by repaying their loan rather than um, buying firewood or charcoal or LPG, and especially with all the children at home, um, the expenses would, would even increase if they were to stop paying for biogas and, and go back to, to firewood. So, so this has really been extremely surprisingly and um, positively um, yeah, successful. We've actually broken all of our loan collection records month after month as a team gained confidence um, that, that this was actually possible. Um, so this has really been uh, really been a huge achievement. And um, finally, I think that what we've really changed and really worked on is how do we uh, keep our team engaged and motivated? Uh, how do we really incentivize um, our sales agents, for example, who are 100% commission-based? How do we uh, get them excited about going to the field um, despite all the fear and all the uncertainty and all the rejection that they have to face. So we've um, done a lot of exciting prizes and awards and a lot of recognition um, and, and really um, been really focused as, as the management team was not traveling. Uh, it was easier to equally spread the time across different teams uh, throughout the regions. Um, so this has been more constant support for everyone, albeit not in person. Um, so, so overall, I would say these have been the, the, the main, main shifts and the main changes. I'm, um, I'm really happy at the end of this year um, that we will probably, uh, we have already sold more units than we have last year. Uh, in, in Kenya, we have collected more money from loans than we have last year, and we've installed more biodigesters than last year. So it's, of course, not what we had initially planned, um, but we have been able to grow because our, our product creates resilience um, and, and our team has proven uh, that they are um, resilient and that they really believe in the change that um, they bring to each household uh, when they close a sale or install a, a biodigester. Thank you, Esther. Um, there's so much within the, the comments that both Sama and Esther have shared. A couple of things I want to pull out because we're talking about surviving and thriving uh, as the topic of this session. And what, what I think we heard from both the soul share and the Sistema Bio perspective is a couple of interesting things, not that this was easy by any means, but it was an opportunity to repeat Esther's phrasing. It was an accelerator of initiatives, things that they were thinking about. Uh, but this opportunity actually forced them uh, to accelerate, to move forward on these, these elements of their business strategy. And the same thing with Sama in terms of some of the innovations of meeting the needs. And a quick question to Salma before I turn to uh, Lisa and uh, Amira 
is do you see some of those innovations that you spoken about work the, the health kits uh, working working that into your system the the larger batteries are those things that you see continuing uh, in in the current as we come out or as we begin to recover and move into the resiliency and growth stages are those the types of innovations that will stay in your product line and in your services Um, yeah, so thank you, Christine. Um, definitely, uh, I mean, if they're, again, so the way we, we will continue is looking at what the demands of our end users are. Um, I saw the question in the box asking us about whether we would, you know, consider moving to, to Africa and also um, on the AC and DC grids. Um, yes, there's definitely, that's something that's in consideration. Um, I just want to clarify that the reason we started working um, in DC is because the uh, solar home systems here in Bangladesh are all DC systems. And this is why when we first created our soul box, which is the point of interconnection within our energy exchange platform, um, the reason we de designed a DC box is because that is what was optimal at that time. But with time and all the end user feedback that we've gained over the years, we began the development of what we call the Soul Box Next Generation. Um, and that box will allow the interconnection of both AC and DC appliances. And the reason we developed that is not only to create a more powerful box so that our users can access more energy, but also so that they can use whatever appliance they want. And this has been through years of end user feedback that we've come to this. We definitely do see this as something um, that we can replicate in, in other countries that have the same sort of problems that we do, remote areas with a, you know, a lot of people living in off-grid areas. Um, we, we are already considering this. We definitely think Rwanda is an excellent option where um, you know, our, our model can definitely be replicated. Um, <clears throat> and to answer your uh, question, Christine, the healthcare packages, yes, as long as um, things like medical care facilities are not available within these areas, we definitely think that that will um, stay as a part of our product line because it's a necessity in these areas. Um, so, you know, the, the encouraging larger batteries um, definitely as well. Um, because the systems in these areas are usually very, very small. So um, people always want to have access to more power. So, you know, if they want a larger system with a larger system comes, you know, larger power supply, larger storage. Um, so definitely it's something that we will continue. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sama. And, I, and again, I think it's, those are both very positive stories about how the companies have responded to the crisis. And, and what I think we didn't get from them was how challenging and hard it was. We got, we got the blessing, not so much of the curse uh, in that regard, but I know from, from listening to them that they've really responded to the challenges they're facing in the field. Speaking of, about challenges, finance is obviously uh, one that's often the access to finance issue has been a major barrier for energy access even before this crisis. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn to both Lisa and Amira and, and ask them, what are you seeing? Uh, Lisa, what, what's happening in, in your work on the crowdfunding side to the, to the demand for your capital as well as the supply of capital? Could you share with us some of the, the, the reactions? Sure, thanks, Christine. Um, so Energize Africa, for those of you uh, who, who don't know us, we're a retail-based investment platform uh, we were born out of um, a DFID process, now uh, FCDO, who was looking at trying to find in innovative ways of um, bridging this financing gap uh, using money from the crowd. And so um, FX and an organization in uh, Holland, Lenderhand, uh, who Esther no doubt knows, um, came together to form uh, Energize Africa. Now we fully launched in 2017 and so we're still relatively young in our development. Um, and I suppose true of everyone uh, in this situation is, you know, 
we did not expect this. This was not in the plan. And so everybody has had to uh, deviate from plans, pivot, and being a relatively new and nimble organization, we've, we've managed to um, adapt quite well in the circumstances. But as we are serving, um, you know, 10 plus organizations in over 10 uh, countries within sub-Saharan Africa, obviously there's a slight difference to, you know, what their experiences are uh, and how COVID has affected um, their businesses. So with us being in still this fairly embryonic um, phase of, of introducing retail investors to investing directly into solar businesses, you know, the, the key thing was for us to um, protect that uh, crowd of people because, you know, we have big ambitions to really scale that up. And it's really important that we uh, take a very cautious approach. So uh, what we did was to um, pause all of the um, campaigns in terms of um, building out new exposure for the organizations who were looking for finance and just take stock of the situation. Um, and we've had to very much, although we've had a sort of uh, blanket wide policy, we have also obviously been talking and tracking and supporting each of the organizations individually uh, depending on what their needs are and how their business has been affected. Um, what we did do which you've mentioned is we um, rolled out a program of refinancing um, so that we could introduce uh, a grace period for those organizations that were due to repay back their capital uh, during this COVID period. And so that has given them a lot more um, flexibility and more time. So we've, the investors have become more patient um, in providing that capital. And actually uh, the crowd has responded really well. So um, for the campaigns that we have done uh, over the period, they have been closing in record time. Uh, okay, they're relatively small campaigns, depending on what the um, refinancing needs of each organization is month to month, but literally they have been closing within a matter of hours. Um, and we have quite a few grumpy investors <laughs> who are asking us, you know, come on, you know, what's what's happening? Where Where is this pipeline? Um, well, I'm pleased to say that we have started opening up exposure on a case by case basis now for um, for the individual organizations if they can meet certain um, performance criteria. And we've been running a number of webinars over the past uh, few months and talking to the businesses and really, you know, exposing the retail crowd to what the situation is on the ground, uh, because that's really important to be completely transparent and to give people a flavor of you know, what the challenges of the businesses are. I'm pleased to say that in some cases, um, you know, the demand has, has grown actually. And uh, you know, organizations like uh, Azuri, who's one of our clients, has certainly seen uh, increased demand because for instance, uh, television, uh, people are at home, the children are at home, and in, in, in some places, uh, education has been um, put out through the television network. So uh, obviously there's an increased demand in, in uh, energy for that. Um, and so actually, uh, obviously not for those people who are perhaps at the bottom of the pyramid, but um, there has been significant um, growth in some areas of the market. Um, so that's really obviously a, a positive and, and something that, um, you know, these organizations are adapting just as Esther talked about as well to their new situation. And it's, it's incredible to see how flexible uh, they can be. And we've also introduced with support from FCDO um, some technical assistance funding mm -hmm. as well for those organizations that have been um, perhaps showing slight signs of stress anyway but COVID has actually just increased that stress 
So, you know, where, uh, where can we provide some extra support um, to help those businesses? So that's the sort of overview of um, our experiences. Excellent. Well, we, we certainly would want to make those grumpy investors happy. Uh, so in, in terms of, um, you know, highlighting the kinds of innovations and efficiencies that the, the enterprises are, are pushing through to work through this crisis, I think does give an opportunity to reduce some risk, but also potentially show them that these are, these are continue to be good sectors to be in. Uh, and, and so to all those grumpy investors on the line, stay patient, there'll be pipeline coming. Exactly. I mean that in the best possible way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, turning to Myro, different type of financial intermediation. But again, the same question. Tell us what you're finding on the demand side. What are the kinds of applications you're seeing? And then on the supply side, what are the types of, of finance flows that are responding to the campaign? Well, um, first, thank you so much. We at Shine are thrilled to be part of this conversation and, uh, and really happy that it's happening on International Human Rights Day. Um, so thank you to all the organizers. We, we truly believe that energy access is a right. And so we come from a, a real justice lens. And, um, and so the, the, the COVID uh, crisis, you know, sort of created an opportunity to, to think about things differently. You know, I feel like uh, we're continuing the trend of a sort of agile and, and relatively new entities. Um, Shine as a uh, uh, secret sauce, I believe, is uh, its convening power. And so in the midst of COVID, what did we do? We, we created a, a, a council of, of women leaders in energy access. Some of these, Ashton, you all know them well because they're Ashton award winners like uh, Ajayda Shao from Frontier Markets, um, you know, some uh, uh, Catherine Lucy from Solar Sister, um, Sarah Alexander, many know with Selco's 25 years of experience bringing to bear on what's happening in communities and um, uh, Sheila Paracha from uh, uh, Energia, basically a listening session of what is happening? How is COVID impacting communities um, around the world? And, and what can we do to make sure that this vital sector of energy access is, is really um, able to, to not only survive, but thrive, right? So this council kind of um, co-created this, this powerful fund. We're really excited because we, we, we believe that, that it's an important innovation, um, not only that because it's, it's women leaders that are visioning it, but and, and are part of a review process that's, that's now vetting grants, um, but it's really recognizing that you know, there will be large scale enterprises that can access recovery grants from governments, you know, that, and there will be some governments that will be well positioned to provide those. Um, but, but there are many countries and many instances where particularly the micro and, and the, the small entrepreneurs and agencies and organizations don't have the chance to access those grants. They need um, um, sort of smaller scale funding to meet their immediate needs so that they survive. So the Shine COVID Recovery Fund was really designed to meet that need. It's, 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 it's really positioned to complement Energia's um, uh, fund, which, which goes to maybe like $3,000 or less or, or so, you know, um, for, for, for really micro um, needs from micro enterprises. It's a bit higher than that, um, three to 10,000, with the idea that it is the sector that actually needs that smaller scale funding that, that has to survive in order for the world to be able to reach the sustainable development goals, but also um, for us to be well positioned with the, 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 the COVID pandemic and future pandemics, right? Um, so how do we um, look at those that are truly community-based, that are in uh, communities, and particularly um, black, brown communities, Africa, Asia, Latin America, that have been um, uh, remote areas off the grid, um, but where people need uh, productive uses of energy in order to be able to have sustainable livelihoods, good jobs. And so how do, do, do we, through this fund, uh, position those, those entities to survive? So this was the thinking behind it, and it's been incredible. 
um, Christine, you ask what what is the demand? It's 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 been broad, right? So and and we've we've gotten um, uh, uh, proposals in now from places like um, Nepal or or the, the the Thai Myanmar border communities that were already at the brink that are now finding it really difficult, as we've already heard in the statistics presented by the Bloomberg team, right? They're finding it really difficult um, uh, to survive. So some of these are really at the nexus of health and, and clean energy. Again, we're, we're in a, a context where there's discussion now of a vaccine, but the recognition that you need to have cold chain, you need to have opportunities to, um, to refrigerate these vaccines, which will not be possible without energy and without clean energy in a sustainable way um, for communities that are that are off grid. So, so it is it is enormous the type of uh, uh, the, the just the the, the the enthusiasm and and um, and and the flow the steady flow of proposals that have come in um, for um, solar. Um, products in, in, from entrepreneurs, from cooperatives, from um, uh, community organizations, um, uh, rural health clinics, the range has been broad and it's been exciting. And what's really powerful is that we've already, you know, our goal is to to, to actually um, by the end of December, even though, you know, this is this quick turnaround here, by the end of December, begin to get money out the door to these organizations to make sure that they, they actually are able to survive in the midst of this pandemic. So we're excited about it. We think that this is a, a model um, that's needed for a sector, um, uh, particularly for a sector that has some very big players that can access big, big sources of investment as well as uh, uh, grant dollars or blended finance even. Um, but there are a lot of other players, particularly uh, the women entrepreneurs that are being um, really left off, um, off the screen. And so uh, this fund is an effort to put them front and center and to make sure that their needs are met so that they survive this pandemic and position not only their communities, but the world um, to be able to survive future pandemics. Thanks, Samara. I very much appreciate and applaud both the, the visioning and the structuring of the fund and, and certainly the orientation of it towards those, uh, those real last mile uh, distributors, if you will. Just one quick follow-up question before I turn back around to, to all of us. Um, how has the supply of capital been? How, what's been the characteristics of this? Uh, has there been a responsiveness to this call to action uh, for a funding window and, and this, you know, this fast, flexible grant monies to this population, to this target audience? I would say there's been there's been some and it's been it's been powerful and important and you know it is anchors like uh, the Wallace Global Fund always out front you know in their call to push foundations to to give more um, during this COVID time to 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 be a part of not only giving five percent of of, uh, of 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 endowments but twenty percent or more right to make sure that this is an op the COVID crisis is an opportunity um, for for foundations to give more so they have been a leader in this in in in, uh, in this fund and both the the creation and the and the seeding of the fund right they were the first monies in the door for us and we're thrilled about that um, we clearly are looking to expand we've gotten. Um, others, in, including uh, uh, Ashton and others that have had, um, uh, USA for Africa, that is Africa focused, but wanting to, to make sure that that Africa uh, energy access is is um, is is funded, um, and particularly at the scale and for community driven initiatives. And so they, you know, they're the ones who who actually uh, uh, spend the proceeds of the We Are the World song, right? Interestingly enough, and so they're new to energy access, but they want to be a part of this fund. And so what we're looking is to, to keep expanding and we're looking to some of the longtime allies in, in uh, at For Shine and in energy access like IKEA, but we're also looking to new, new players um, that want to be a part going forward, especially faith-based uh, and values-driven um, um, investors and philanthropists. We believe that this very much aligns 
with where value-driven donors um, are, are going. And, in, and, and so creating this opportunity for them to, to play a role has been exciting. So we are, we are thrilled at what's come already and we're, we're really looking forward to more um, because we're hoping to grow this, right? I feel like our couple of women leaders said, let's get a million dollars. Like let's set our game high. <laughs> and um, and it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, we, we haven't quite gotten there and but we're, we're, we're hoping to, to, um, to be able to, to continue to expand the fund and we look forward to, um, to other um, allies joining us. Excellent. And, and thank you, Amara, for that. And with that question, what I was trying to get to for the audience on the line, which is pr very diverse, and I applaud uh, Ashton for bringing this diverse audience together, is that, uh, you know, we've you know, both, both Energize Africa and Shine are intermediaries of different types of capital down to the enterprises who are delivering the services. Both of those need support. Right, so, so many investors go directly into the enterprise level, which is critical. We heard from Salma about how they were able to facilitate something with DEG, which offline I'm gonna dig into a little bit deeper with her. But, but also it's the intermediaries themselves who are providing such important services to this space. And it's, it's not either or, it's both, because both the intermediary as well as the enterprise really uh, serve such critical elements because you're basically going as Lisa has indicated, she, she's taking retail investors. She's becoming a wholesaler, if you will, of the retail investors down to the enterprises, if I have that, that kind of lingo correctly, where um, you know, Elmira, in essence, is wholesaling in funding and then retailing it down to the investors. They're different models of different kinds of capital, both of which are needed in this marketplace to, to stimulate growth, which is what leads to scale. Couple of questions coming in that I'd like to turn around to our to our audience. Um, Owen uh, Grafton mentions that in Takaharo's presentation and what we're familiar with from the NDEV results is that there were a number of different uh, types of capital needed. We've talked specifically about grant capital coming in from Shine, that sort of assistance down to the small level. Lisa's talked about the refinancing, uh, the extending of grace periods. There were a couple of other areas in Takahara's presentation from NDEV that showed um, grant funding, assistance with accessing COVID funds, bridging loans, concessional finance, new equity, technical and operational support. I think what Owen's asking both Salma and Esther is, what would your prioritization be of the type of capital, uh, given the breadth of capital that was captured in the NDEV results? So just very quickly, what would be if you had you know, what, what's the most, what's the best kind of capital that you need to move through this pandemic situation and position yourself for growth? Um, I mean, um, the, the quick answer, uh, I think, is not necessarily capital, but um, uh, confidence uh, in uh, future capital, uh, even if, like, if capital immediately is, is not an option, um, at least some um, capacity to look into the future with confidence. Uh, so, uh, and, and that can be um, done in, in many different ways. We were actually uh, planning for, for a larger uh, round of investment and, and have downsized it to a bridge round uh, this year, which we've just successfully closed, but there has been um, a small period uh, of time when there was a lot of uncertainty in the in the world, but on uh, this fundraising and, and how this would impact our cash cash runway. So, um, not necessarily. It's not that we immediately needed cash, but we needed some small level of, of certainty and confidence uh, into the future. Um, that that is is really helpful, and I think. Along with that certainty uh, comes, uh, I think, a need for, um, it, it's really hard to connect with an investor who's based in, in very uh, nice office in developed countries um, when we're on the ground trying to keep the jobs for all of our team members uh, and keep our clients happy with little resources and a lot of stress and sleepless nights. Uh, so this was before uh, there was a bit of a, a travel and connection through due diligence visits or field visits, and this has been completely stopped uh, in, in COVID. So I think 
really keeping a, a high level of connection and empathy between investor and investee um, is, is something that I'm, they're very intangible uh, on, the, on the confidence no, and the empathy, but this has really been um, something for us really important and we're really uh, happy to have our existing investors reinvesting even if um, our, a lot of things have changed and, and their continuous support is extremely valuable uh, in, in those um, in Thank 2020. You. Yeah. Thank you, Esther. Um, I've realized in looking at my clock that we've reached the top of the hour. Um, I certainly feel like we could take this conversation further. Um, so let's, let's position this as a teaser. I encourage all of you as you are interested to and available to work with the intermediaries, Energize Africa and Shine Campaign, as well as to learn from or su more importantly support the work of SoulShare and Sistema Bio, as well as the, the network of Ashton Award winners uh, that we have. It's an amazing portfolio. Uh, I thank Ashton and Bloomberg New Energy Finance for this opportunity to host, but more importantly, for bringing this conversation together and enabling us to see it from different dimensions. Um, I think it's really important to hear from all of them that this not, not diminishing the significance or the seriousness, but every one of our speakers has indicated this has presented an opportunity. And I think we all need to grasp that as we move into uh, a period of, of, of still great difficulty, but as well as positioning ourselves for recovery uh, and growth and scale, because that's what's going to enable us to meet those SDG goals and deliver universal energy access for all. So thank you very much. Thank you to the Ashton uh, uh, organizers and sponsors. And I wish you all uh, the best as we move into the holiday seasons. And please stay well and stay safe. Thank you very much. Have a great day and evening. Signing thank off. You. Thank you, everyone. Be well, everyone. Stay strong. Bye. Bye. Thank you.